Happy Mother's Day to the moms in the room, including my own mother and my wife and my mother-in-law. Uh, we thank you for all that you do, moms, and we thank you for the influence that you've had on so many of our lives. As I think about a mother's influence and just the power of influence in general, this passage in Timothy comes to mind that I want to read as I begin my message for you this morning. Paul is writing to Timothy from a jail cell, and the love and the care that Paul has for Timothy is so evident in the opening lines. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. It's why I remind you to fan into flame the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. In verse 13, he says to Timothy, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learned from me. A pattern shaped by the faith and the love that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Timothy was just a young man when Paul wrote this letter to him. He was someone that Paul had taken under his wing and had mentored to the point that he had become a pastor at the church in Ephesus. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy and had considerable influence in his life. We don't know a whole lot about Timothy's earthly father other than that it's mentioned that his father was a Gentile. It's possible that at this point in, in Timothy's life his father had died or uh, maybe more uh, credible was that he was not a person of faith because there was no mention of any kind of godly influence of the father upon Timothy. But yet, in this passage, Paul refers quite fondly to the genuine faith that was in Timothy that had first been in his grandmother and then also in his mother. And we find that Timothy had been nurtured in an environment of living faith by these women. In fact, a few chapters later, Paul adds, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught them to you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. The fruit of faith was clearly evident in Timothy's mother and grandmother to the point that Paul could point to it and say to Timothy, you know you can trust what you've been taught because of what you've seen. These women had been intentional to teach Timothy the word of God from the time he was a young boy. Their influence had shaped his faith. And now Paul is challenging Timothy, hold on to that which you've been taught. When I look over my own personal life, I can see how so many people shape me or have influenced who I am today. Someone asked me recently, what was the best thing about growing up as a pastor's kid? You know, I, it caught me by surprise. I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. Most people ask it sort of in a negative way. So what's the worst thing about being a pastor's kid? What was that like? And I had to think for a bit, interesting question, what is the best thing about being a pastor's kid? And one of the, you know, there were several answers that came to mind, but one of them was that, well, one of the best things about being a pastor's kid was that we had so many visiting great men and women of God who would come to our church and would stay in our home. And they would chat at the table and chat in the living room. And I'd be like sort of the fly on the wall. And I just loved 
hearing their stories and seeing how they live their lives, and all of it just left a mark on me. It sparked a desire when I think about it. Uh, it, it those stories and those people and their lives uh, had such an influence on me and sparked something in me to do something great for God. Often those people would take a, a special interest in me and, and, and encourage me. I can look back and see how some of the teachers I had in my life influenced me. My first basketball coach had a big impact on me. And when I look at my coaching style today, I, I see a lot of it was tied to his influence. Apparently, my, my parents have had a big influence on me because I, I recently was the keynote speaker at a conference in Minnesota, and one of the pastors at the, who was attending the conference remarked in a positive way to me after about how much I refer to my mom and dad in my sermons and the things that they've said to me. There was a lady who was at the conference who I had not seen in 30, over 30 years. She had been a part of our First, uh, my dad's church, his first church in Swan River, Manitoba, before we moved here. So I hadn't seen her, I don't think, since I had moved. Over 30 years, her son had been one of my best friends growing up. And now she lived in Minnesota and was attending one of the churches who, who uh, were at the conference. And she saw I was the keynote speaker. And so she came to hear me. She remarked afterwards how much like my father I was. She said, I could even see his mannerisms in your mannerisms. I could hear his voice as you were preaching, and she was hugging me, and it was all weird and wonderful. <laughs> the point I want to make is that we are products of influence, all of us. Whether we even realize it or not, our life experiences and the people we have interacted with and the things we have been taught have all influenced how we think and how we act. Some of those influences have been positive, hopefully most of them, but some have also been negative. And here's the thing about influence, it's powerful. It's passed from one generation to the next. It lives on even after you're gone. And every day you're being influenced. And every day you are also influencing. Your influence can be intentional or it can be unintentional, but I promise you it's happening. Your influence is happening by the actions that you take or by your refusal to take action. There's no such thing as living influentially neutral. We are influencers whether we want to be or not. We have no choice in that regard. But I do believe we can have a say in what type of influence we're going to have. I remember my father, see here I go. I remember my father saying to me as a young man, son you have a natural gift of leadership. People are going to follow you whether you like it or not. You're either going to lead them to Jesus or you're going to lead them away from Jesus but you will lead them so lead wisely. That felt like a lot of pressure at the time and I didn't want that responsibility but it has always stuck with me. But you know in a sense this is true for all of us. God has made us relational beings. Therefore, uh, by nature, we're connected and shaped by our daily interactions with one another. And so as a result, the scriptures warn us to be both careful about who we associate with because it's going to influence us. But also the scriptures challenge us in how we act and to be a positive influence and a positive example to shine bright. Let me give you some examples. In Proverbs 13, 20, uh, Solomon uh, challenged us to walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul wrote, Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. These are warning verses and there are others. But how about the ones that challenge us to be an influencer in a positive way? 
As Timothy had been influenced positively, Paul challenges him to do the same. He said to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Young people, it doesn't matter how uh, young you are, you can be an example and you can be an influence no matter what your age. Jesus said in Matthew 15, uh, or 5, verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. We've been called to be an influence. And so the big question that to answer for all of us is what is influencing us and what kind of influence are we being? You know, when I think about influence, I realize that my purpose in life is tied to my influence. The more influence that I can have in a positive way, the more fulfillment that I have in my life. There's probably nothing that brings me greater joy when I think about it. There's nothing that gives me more meaning in my life than when a person comes and tells me that something that I said or something that I did had a positive impact on them. But you know, the reverse is probably also true. When we see that we've uh, influenced someone in a negative way, there's a pain that comes with that that cuts so deep. One other sobering thought is the idea that one day we will have to give an account for the influence that we've had, both positive and negative. One time Jesus said these words in Matthew 18, verse 5, And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's strong words. He goes on to say, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? In Matthew 12, verse 36, uh, Jesus said, And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Paul said in Romans 14, 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. So church, we're going to have an influence and we're accountable for it. So then let's consider What are some ways we can have maximum effectiveness in being a positive influence? That's what I, that's where I want to go today. Let, let me give you a few thoughts in that regard. I have three thoughts for you this morning. How can we maximize our influence in a positive way? The first thought that comes to mind is this. Our personal character is most important when it comes to having an influence. When I study scripture, I see that God places a premium on our personal character over everything else. Often, however, we don't place it at the same level of value. That's true both in the church world and it's true outside of the church. We often place a higher value on gifting, on talent, or charisma over personal integrity. And the reason for this is related to influence. A preacher who can move the crowd with oratory skills or the charismatic leader who can inspire his followers with his energy and his style has an opportunity to influence. Talent draws attention. Gifting gets noticed. Charisma is magnetic. All these things are wonderful in regard to making an impact and leaving a mark. However, when personal character doesn't match the talent or gifting, disaster is about to happen. Not only is influence lost, but greater pain is often the result. And the influence can quickly flip from positive to negative. 
I want us to notice the premium that Paul puts on character in his instructions when it comes to church leadership. He says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. In other words, be hospitable. He must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. In all this description uh, that Paul gives to Timothy about someone who aspires to church leadership, the only gift that's mentioned in this description is the ability to teach. Everything else is related to personal character. In Paul's instructions regarding spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, he lists all the gifts that the Spirit gives to us. He exhorts us to eagerly desire them. Yet in the middle of this exhortation, he pauses to remind us that gifting without character will result in lost influence. In 1 Corinthians 13, right in the middle of this exhortation on gifts, he pauses to say, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Church, when you are just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, you have become an irritant and annoying. You have lost your influence. People's thoughts are going to be more get away from me than listen to what you have to say. It's love that gives you influence more than anything else. But what is love? Well, Paul describes it. But notice how he describes it in terms of character traits. It's patient. It's kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. When you have these character traits, I promise you, you will always have influence. It always amazes me how character is given a backseat in our priority list until a major blow up reveals it should have been at the top. We minimize it in others. And we minimize it in ourselves until one day we get this rude awakening that it was the thing that mattered the most. You know, these days it seems that everyone wants a platform. With the rise of social media, anyone who wants one can get one. In fact, being an influencer is one of the buzzwords in in our society. It's a job that so many aspire to be. People dream of getting a big enough following on social media that they can be an influencer and make a living off of it. But if you truly want to have influence that matters in the most important stuff, it will all boil down to how you live your life in matters of integrity and love. You know, it is true that my parents have had the greatest impact on who I am today. I listen to what they say. I still love to hear my dad preach. He's still my favorite preacher. I value my mother's opinion probably more than almost any opinion in the world. Her guiding voice has always had a place in my life. But why have they impacted me so profoundly? I promise you it's not because of their gifting and their talent, although they have much of that. It has very little to do with what you have seen on stage. It's based on what I have seen in the privacy of my own home growing up. 
The conversations behind closed doors, the actions that most of you have never had the privilege to see. It's the way they loved me and the way they loved my sister. It's the way they loved each other. It's the way they have loved others also. It's in the way they give sacrificially. It's in the way that they make time for others at personal inconvenience. It's in the way they encourage. It's in the way they repent. It's in the way they forgive. I could go on. A lot of pastors' kids resent their parents because they feel pushed to the back pushed to the background or they saw a disconnect between the dad in the pulpit and the dad at home, I promise you I never felt that way. In fact, one of the biggest reasons why I never ran from God when I was really close to was because of what I saw in my parents' lives. Like Timothy, I saw genuine faith, not phony faith, Genuine faith in my parents in action. It was visible on the stage and it was visible behind closed doors. As a result, their influence has run deep in my life. Truthfully, their personal character has given them influence in the lives of many for a long time. Even over people with perhaps greater gifting. Because at the end of the day, the greater your character, the greater your influence. How you live always will speak louder than what you say. So many people want platforms. But I would argue the greatest influencers in the world are usually the ones that most people have never heard of. It's the character of those closest to us that shapes us the most. You know, I also believe that those who have character have unintended influence. What I mean is that because of who they are, they just influence people that they never specifically targeted to influence. It just happens as people are around them observing and seeing and watching. And so my challenge to us this morning is to remember that our ability to influence positively is most impacted by our personal character, not by any platform or gifting. If God gives you a platform, if God gives you gifting, what a great opportunity. But what a great responsibility you have received as well. If your character is weak, you will lose your influence and the consequences are even more significant. The second thought about how to have maximum imp- uh, impact and influence is that authenticity is a real key. It's closely related to what I've just been saying, but the point I want to make is that the minute you are seen as a phony, you've lost your influence. When who you are in action doesn't line up with what you say, you will lose your voice. So just be real. Just be honest. Just acknowledge your weaknesses. Don't try to pretend that you're something you're not. Paul said in Romans 12 verse 9, love must be sincere or without hypocrisy, another translation says. You know, we often put on masks because we feel like if people saw the real me, they wouldn't like me or listen to me. It would change the way they feel about me. It would influence how they see me. But isn't it ironic that it is the mask that does us way more damage? It doesn't take people long to figure out if we're wearing a mask. And when that happens, our influence is over. I just said that character is very important, and I think we know that. So when we blow it, we think we better hide it. Or if we have some character weaknesses, we feel the need to try and cover them up. The reality is, even the most character-filled people still have some character flaws and weaknesses. But to me, one of the greatest signs of character is to be honest about our weaknesses and real about them. 
You know, as much as I've honored my parents here this morning, I promise you they were not perfect. My dad made mistakes. My mom made mistakes. I always knew when my dad overreacted, and he did from time to time. It's kind of a Wells trait. When he overreacted or spoke out of anger or impatience, it didn't happen very often, but when it did, I knew it wouldn't be that long before there would be a knock on my bedroom door and my father would go in and say, son, I blew it. I was wrong in the way I handled that. Would you please forgive me? To me, that always revealed his heart more than anything else. Most people know that perfection is impossible. All they want is authenticity. We live in a world of fake everything, including the news. Give me something authentic and you'll have my attention. Be real, and you will always have a voice. My third and final thought this morning is that consistency increases your influence. Most of us don't like growing old. Every year I look at the photos and I go, man, I can't believe how much hair I lost this year. This summer, this thing, you might see this thing going right to the bone. I, I, get ready. Most of us don't like growing old. But I want to tell you there is an advantage to it in one particular area. If you have demonstrated character and authenticity consistently over a long stretch, your influence has increased dramatically. You build trust as you prove yourself. As I mentioned, I, I just got back from Minnesota a couple of weeks ago where I was uh, the keynote speaker at a leadership conference for a network of churches. Honestly, that was a first for me in North America. I've sometimes spoke at conferences, but I've never been sort of the keynote. It was intimidating. I, I, I was thinking to myself, I don't know if I've got anything to say. Don't you want my dad, you know? I'm not sure if I'm smart enough for this. But you know, what I realized as I wrestled through some of that insecurity was that I did have something to impart to those who were in attendance. I have been involved in ministry uh, for over 25 years of some kind. I've had some battles. I've gone through some stuff. I've learned some lessons. And I have served the Lord faithfully for a long time. Not perfectly, but faithfully. By God's grace, I think I can look back over my life and say I have walked with some consistency. I'm realizing that that has resulted now in an increased level of influence. People are wanting to hear what I have to say. There is a level of influence that only time and consistency can give you. Character is easy to demonstrate when things are going well. But what about in bad times? How you handle crisis reveals your character more than anything. And it helps to mold it. If you're consistent in the good and in the bad, your influence is growing. As time goes by, the ups and downs of life are experienced fully. And who you are becomes more clearly revealed. As tests are given and passed, credibility increases. In fact, God uses tests for this very purpose. Just ask Joseph how God grew his influence. He threw, he let him be thrown into a well. He, and after passing the well test, he uh, sent him as a slave to Potiphar. And after passing the slave test, he allowed him to go into prison. And after passing the prison test, Joseph's character was revealed and he rose to a place of influence in Egypt that was second only to Pharaoh. 
consistency through the trials of life elevated Joseph's influence. His consistency proved his worth and ultimately gave him a platform. What about Daniel? Daniel demonstrated consistency in the face of fierce opposition. He refused to change his ways. He refused to hide his faith. He refused to compromise. He did it at great potential personal cost. But passing the test of consistency ultimately increased his influence. How many of you want to make an impact? How many of you want to have influence Well, I tell you, that's a dangerous prayer to pray. You might be asking for a test that you don't want. But isn't that an interesting way to look at the trials of life? You are being given an opportunity to grow your credibility and your influence by the way you handle those things. When a church is in trouble or facing real challenges, they often call my father. Those were some of the regular phone calls that he received as I was growing up and to this day. My father has real street cred in the church world. Why? Because he's been through every battle imaginable over his 45 years in ministry. And he's come out a winner Every time on the other side. He's passed the test of time. And you know what happens? Now everyone wants to hear what he has to say. So let me bring this to a conclusion in summary. Character, authenticity, and consistency are all tied together. Show me a person with these qualities... And I'm all ears. And I'm watching closely. These are the kinds of people that I want to influence me. And I think it's the same for you. So the question is this. What's coming from our lives? What are people saying about us? What do they see in us? What kind of influence are we having? You know, when I think about what Paul said to Timothy about his mother and grandmother, I think the greatest desire in my life would be to have someone speak to my children about me the way Paul spoke to Timothy about his mother and grandmother. I would love to have people refer to Joel Wells and say, I've seen his genuine faith. I would love people to see a legacy of faith passed down from one generation to another in my family. What was in Dave was in Joel. What was in Joel was in Eden. What was in Eden was in... Surprise me, honey. I would love for people to refer to Harvest City Church in the same way. I would love that the testimony on the streets of Regina is that Harvest City is a, is a church that can be trusted because their character, their authenticity, and their consistency has demonstrated that what they say about Jesus is real. It's real. That's a challenge to us, church. But if we will walk humbly before our God, he will lift us up. I believe that. Is that all right? Why don't you stand to your feet here this morning? Let me pray for you. And then don't forget there's a photo booth uh, just by the fireplace in the foyer if you want to get a picture there with your mom. Uh, That would be awesome. Father, I just thank you so much for every mom that's in the room this morning, every grandmother, those that bore us, but also those that have mentored us and mothered us spiritually. I thank you for all of them. I thank you for the tremendous influence that they've had in our lives.
Father, I pray today in Jesus' name. I just want to pray specifically for every mom. I pray that you would strengthen them, help them, encourage them. Lord, I think there's probably some moms in this room who are going, I tried to have a positive influence, but it doesn't seem like I'm getting the fruit that I wanted from it. God, I pray that every seed that's been sown in Jesus' name would bear fruit, would bear fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would even bring to attention some of those things that the moms have said over the years back into the memory. Lord, I thank you that the the words that have been sown, the actions that have been sown are still seeds in the ground. And we call it forth in Jesus' name, bear fruit. Lord, I pray for uh, all of us today that you would help us to increase our influence. Help us to be sobered about our influence. Lord, forgive us for the places where we've been negative influences. Help us to uproot those things from our lives. Lord, we want to lead people towards Jesus, not away from Jesus. We we don't want to say one thing and do another thing. So help us to be sincere. God, forgive us even for our hypocrisy and where we've sown things uh, negatively. God, by your grace, would you uproot those things that have been planted and cause only that which has been good and true and wholesome to bear fruit. God, I pray for, for this church. Oh, God, Lord, help us to be ones who have a great influence in this city. Lord, enlarge our influence And so, Lord, sober us that we must be consistent in our character and our authenticity. We need you. Without it, Lord God, we can't do it. We can't do it. We need the grace that only you can give us, the strength that only you can provide to live the kind of lives we want to live. So fill us with your Holy Spirit, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. I'm going to give you part two next week. I think. Hey everyone, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope you enjoyed it and found something that spoke to you or blessed you in some way. That really is the heart of Harvest City Church, that you take what you've heard, learned, or experienced here, and then go out and share that good news with others. So go ahead and post this video to your page, start conversations, and who knows the lives that God could transform through it. If we can support you in some way in this season, please let us know. Maybe you've decided to dedicate your life fully to Jesus. We want to hear about it and celebrate with you and help you in those first steps. Connecting in to share the joys and the struggles of life is why we're here. Finding community is super important too, so if you're wondering about any of our programs for kids, youth, or adults, just reach out to us by phone or at the link below and we'll be in touch. To all of those who are partnering financially with us, thank you for your investment into the Kingdom of God. It allows us to do what He's calling us to and reach even more people. For more info on that, go over to harvestconnect.ca slash give. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our live stream chat area at harvestconnect.ca slash live. It's a great place for interaction, commenting, prayer with our online hosts, and more. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our social pages and all that good stuff too. Take care, keep living your call, and we'll see you again real soon.